Welcome everyone. Uh, we're now in uh, week 10. Uh, this was the final week for our osteotomy course. Today we're going to, uh, um, or last week, I want to first review what we did in week nine. This is the trauma uh, osteotomy weekly with the diaphyseal uh, and distal tibia. Um, last week we heard from, uh, Brett was the moderator, and we had uh, Mitch, Sean, and Tim all give us their, uh, their talk. Um, we are recording uh, this session um, as we have been with all of them so that, uh, so that they can be re reviewed and viewed uh, at another time. Um, so you should leave your cameras off. Your microfilms are muted already and your cameras uh, will not come on. So you should be okay with it. At the start of the meeting, uh, like I said, now your microphones are turned off except for the panelists and the presenters. Um, we don't have the question and answer function uh, up today, I don't believe, but we do have the chat. You can do the chat and this is where we'll ask questions because we're set up as a case discussion. These were the faculty from uh, last, uh, our last one I told you, Mitch Bernstein, Sean Nork, and uh, Tim Weber. Um, and uh, Mitch talked to us about non-union dealing with bone loss, including bone transport. And he wanted you to consider these factors, acute versus chronic, open fractures, whether they have uh, need soft tissue, infection, bone loss. Think about the host and where the location is for the, um, for the injury. Is it periarticular or diaphyseal? He also uh, was very careful to show us all of the, um, that the um, AO, the trauma principles of anatomic reduction, stable internal fixation, preservation of the blood, side, blood supply and early motion mimic almost identically the Elizarov principles of preservation again of the blood, blood supply and bone, anatomic reduction and stable fixation so that you can move your joints. He then went over indications for bone transport and he lumped them into two post-traumatic versus acute and these were the suspects that will eventually need a bone transport and how to deal with, uh, with the, them. And I thought that was important because you might think about things a little bit different and plan to do some of these things. He went over the, all of these techniques or most of these techniques, a lizard off, lengthening over a nail, lengthening and then nailing, cable pulley systems, all internal, and then plate assisted bone transport. And he showed some very elegantly done cases, how you can use all of this. And I thought uh, his case examples were outstanding. His, uh, this was his summary and his future directions. He said that a Lizarov method is a powerful tool for limb reconstruction, but that you must adhere to the principles despite advances in technology. Learning to combine strategies is where we're heading and there's no right way. And now we're using some more integrated techniques where we're using X fix and nails and plates and trying to uh, to, to, to get people out of fixators early and he showed some nice techniques for that. And we are seeing the evolution of all internal bone, bone transport techniques. So I think the future for bone transport is exciting. We're going to have some new things. I think as orthopedists, we all like uh, new uh, techniques. And so I think this is going to be nice. Next, we heard from Sean for indications for an osteotomy. Uh, he showed us uh, these articles from San Georgian. Um, about a mathematically directed osteotomy. He said we can only use it for these uh, types of uh, uh, deformities. Translation didn't work very well because you, you couldn't really do medial lateral or anterior translation uh, with a mathematically directed osteotomy. So it must be an angular deformity without translation so that you can calculate a single angular deformity. And that by determining the sum of the deformities in these two planes, our AP and our lateral, we can find the view where there's no deformity and where there's a maximum deformity and these will be 90 degrees from each other. So by using standard or orthogonal x-rays, AP and lateral, we can determine these things. And so Sean went through a very elegant way of taking this and then turning it into this by a single cut mathematically directed osteotomy. He took us through the case and I just copied his pictures and put them in here. It's a complicated way of 
of, of, of doing it. It's very nice. I want to highlight that we will be doing this in the live exercise with a model so that you will have a chance to better understand this. If you're confused, if you were confused by this, I don't blame you. It's very, it's complicated the first uh, two or three times you hear it, but eventually as you start playing with models and doing other types of, uh, uh, of cases and planning, you'll catch the neck of it. The take home is it's infrequently, but it's a very useful and it's a very elegant osteotomy. Do the math. Rotations occur with every oblique osteotomy, so go the right direction, ascending or descending, because you don't want to double your rotational deformity. And the steepness of the obliquity determines the amount of rotational correction. And he showed he went through it very nicely how to get this done. Um, and like I said, ascending and descending, descending determines the direction of the rotational correction. And out, and calculating this angle phi is critical for for avoiding. In induction of a deformity on the no deformity view. So that's the angle that you're going to rotate to do your osteotomy in, and it's important to calculate that. And, and next we heard from Tim, looking at extra articular deformities and indication for osteotomies. He pointed out the critical part of looking and doing a good clinical exam, specifically with the subtailor. Look at their gait, their motor strength. Um, pointed out that the area of the contact is only one third the hip of the knee uh, of the hip or the knee, uh, and it's a complex joint motion and architecture, and the blood supply is critical, um, and we need to really be careful <laughs> and know this anatomy uh, to do these uh, uh, osteotomies. There's different types you can do: rotational, medial, and lateral opening or closing. Uh, consider where the previous incisions and in soft tissue is, and then. What do you do with the fibula? And he cut it and lets it move with the tibia. His take home lessons was to really carefully evaluate the subtalar joint. Most angular corrections will be done from the medial side because it's easier to get to. Um, fibular osteotomy and allow it to seek its position. Restoring normal anatomy can produce satisfying results. And he showed some very elegant cases to do all this. Uh, and these are all available on the Zoom uh, thing. So our summary take home points for last week were to be able to list the indications for tibial deformity correction and non-union, to be able to utilize the deformity correction techniques that we showed you to restore extra and intra-articular alignment and recognize strategies for lengthening and bone transport. So now I wanna move on to this week's uh, topic or this week's conclusion to, to summarize all of those points. Uh, we have myself and Brett and uh, as the moderators, remember to use the chat function. We have uh, some outstanding experts. We have Tim Weber, Keith Mayo, Raphael Neiman, Raul Vedia, Steve Benershka and Mike Miranda and here uh, and Maurizio Cafori. And we have a special guest today uh, Steve Quinnen is joining us as well. So we have a we have an expert panel here uh, that I hope you get some uh, really good use. At this part, I'm going to turn uh, my uh, screen over to uh, Tim Weber, and Tib's going to take us through uh, the first case and ask some questions. Yeah, thanks, Mike. <clears throat> um, so just uh, quickly, uh, as we get started, I, I just want a uh, quick shout out to Mike and Brett. Uh, we're finally to the end of this course. Uh, they've done just an absolute yeoman's job uh, at getting uh, us to this point uh, and really providing a really, really uh, educational experience for everybody. I think this is uh, amazing. And if we were in a live setting, uh, you know, you get a, a standing ovation, but unfortunately we can't do that. But, um, just recognize that you can't even begin to imagine how many hours these guys have put in uh, to make this happen. Um, really a, a great job, guys. Um, so this first case, a 20-year-old uh, male uh, got his foot caught in an auger um, working on his uh, parents' uh, farm. Uh, he comes in with missing his uh, uh, end of his fibula here. Um, he's also got a heel pad evulsion that we treated. Um, lucky for him, he does have his uh, uh, perineal tendons, uh, ironically, are still uh, intact, uh, but the fibula is not. Um, if we uh, 
go ahead and move that forward, Mike, if you can. Yeah. So um, we went ahead and did some stress views uh, just to see how stable the ankle is, uh, whether the deltoid would be able to tether this or not. And uh, you can see how the medial uh, clear space opens or where the ankle mortise opens over there, uh, an unstable ankle. And, and that was sort of his sensation too when he was walking on this, that this, this was not uh, stable for him. Um, and so at this point, you know, what, what are our options? Uh, I'm going to need you to probably move this forward. Mike. If, you, if you just click in the middle, it'll move. Okay. There we go. All right. So here's his, uh, now this was 14 years ago. Uh, this is his uh, uh, 3D CT at that time. Um, just a little bit more information, but not really. I mean, we kind of know what was going on. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, what are our treatment options at this point? Um, I would be interested in, in, you know, obviously nowadays we probably have some different treatment options that we might consider. Um, maybe Brett could uh, speak up with regards to uh, osteoarticular allograft here. Uh, or if, if someone else has a, uh, another idea as to uh, how to solve this problem for this young man. Why don't we hear from Brett and then uh, I think I'll ask Stevie B, Steve Bernerska, what his thoughts are. So go ahead, Brett. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think the big challenge is you don't have that lateral post to prevent subluxation of the talus. And so um, the only concern I have about what it looks like right now is that there's not bone stock distally, so it would be a complete osteoarticular allograft, including the entire cortex of the distal fibula, which um, takes a really long time to incorporate even for fresh ones. Uh, and so what would be ideal would be to gain some bone stock distally. Uh, and then uh, I think uh, osteochondral allograft for the articular surface of the fibula would be viable. And then you'd also have to uh, consider the soft tissue if there, uh, if there's any uh, remains of the ligaments distally, um, calcanea fibula or talofibular ligaments, because um, the soft tissue would be also a concern. Even though it's it's going to be scarred in, you'd still want to try to potentially re reconstruct those. Anyone else, Steve? Did you have a, a thought on this? He just may need to unmute himself. Steve, Steve, you need to unmute yourself. See if I can do it. Here we go. Can you hear me now? Now we can. And this well, I think that, you know, Tim, you showed in your, actually, the I guess the case last week, the, the position of his foot when he stands, there's a couple of things going on besides the fibula. He's got a cave his foot. And uh, if you look at that lateral view, his foot supinated. His, uh, the uh, sinus is completely open and he's walking on the lateral border of his foot. And that is partly due potentially to the, the perineal weakness he may have, but he has looked like a, a, a cave his foot to begin with. So this just sort of accentuates the problem. And uh, I always think about that. I just had a case like this two days ago where essentially the deformity was totally related to malalignment of the subtalar joint as a result of insidiously sort of progressing to this supinated position. So I, I think I, that was a picture that you had on your case last week, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, so just to, I guess, move along, because I think we've got a fair amount of cases today, all of which are pretty interesting. Um, my thought was uh, that maybe we could use the articular cartilage uh, that is the syndesmosis joint. Uh, to move that down and, and allow him to articulate uh, the lateral talus on that. Um, and so we just planned out a, uh, a sort of step cut uh, uh, osteotomy of the fibula here. I think this is um, a really nice technique. It's, it's well shown in Jeff Mast's book um, with a, a push-pull screw attached to the distal fragment. 
uh, use a lamina spreader uh, in a verbruge, a verbruge to hold the plate on the bone, uh, lamina spreader to get length. We used a second lamina spreader here in the osteotomy once we started opening it up just to, uh, to gain our, our length here. Um, that's a, a picture from Jeff's book, uh, tribute to him uh, uh, for this. This is obviously with a fracture, but same concept and it works so well. Um, here it is uh, uh, at the end of the case. Um, I think in retrospect, I probably would have uh, 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 allowed this, the ankle mortis to be a little bit wider. I think I may have stenosed him a little bit, um, but uh, here he is uh, post-op. Um, by going ahead and doing a step cut, we were allowed, we uh, had uh, bone contact right from the beginning, easy for this to heal, uh, uh, did bone graft in, uh, the uh, osteotomy site there, but uh, here he is at four months. Um, he's broken his uh, syndesmotic screw. I will say, um, and I don't know, Mike, if you took uh, the slide out, uh, maybe, um, but uh, I had forgot, uh, sometimes you get uh, so wound up in the excitement of the case, uh, I forgot to take out my push-pull screw. And so my push-pull screw is still in. Uh, I don't know if I can, if it's on one of the earlier ones or not. But you can see up here where I had my push-pull screw. But I use the uh, time to take the uh, syndesmotic screw out to uh, to uh, <laughs> uh, carefully cover up my blunder. Uh, but um, anyway, you know his ankle mortis looks pretty good. We've tried a couple different times. He lives out of state now. According, you know, his parents still farm the farm. And uh, according to his parents, he's not had any further surgery uh, on this, um, which is a little surprising to me. Uh, but, you know, he is a pretty tough kid too. Um, so I think, you know, in large part, it may be due more towards uh, him just being a tough kid. Um, I think the take home messages on this, uh, you know, oftentimes we can use uh, our, own, our own body for spare parts. Uh, I think a step cut uh, provides us some real stability and also uh, quick healing uh, also. Um, and uh, uh, I think that the, the push pull screw is a great uh, uh, technique for being able to uh, gain a lot of length and uh, under control in the operating room. Just real quick, uh, somebody asked uh, potentially about distraction osteogenesis. Steve, what do you, Quinnen, do you think uh, that's an option for this case? Um, yeah, I mean, you can definitely transport down a fibula that way. Um, kind of just set up a little mini two ring construct that has, uh, what I like to do is use something like a Rancho cube with a, a couple three or four millimeter half pins. And if you had to go down a really long way, um, that can work really well if for some reason it's super short or they have fibular hemimelia. Okay. That's a cool idea also. One, one thing, uh, that final lateral, Tim, you could see that just to, to not to beat a dead horse, but subtle cavus leads to the osteophyte you see in his medial neck. And you can see that actually would be something that would be easy to do later. He would get uh, more ankle dorsiflexion because he's impinging anteromedially, and that's just because of his cavus foot. Okay. Any other thoughts people have? Okay, I'm going to take control from you. Uh... Tim. Um, and so now we will uh, move on to uh, this case. This is uh, Raphael. This is your case, correct? You're on mute, Raphael. I can't hear you. Huh. You want to? Yeah, I think we'll have to go on. Case. 
Yeah, I'll yeah. Have to go to another case. Um, Maybe he can come. Uh, he come. Back. Can you hear me now? Oh, there he goes. No, yeah, sorry about that, you guys. Hear. Something happened there with Zoom. Um, quick question about the the deltoid. Um, when you stressed it, uh, Tim, you notice how much wider it was on the medial side, and you know what what I've learned over the last few years looking at all these um, these papers that have come through. Uh, about fixing the deltoid, which I do very frequently now with something that that's wide. Um, was there, and maybe we just weren't thinking about it 10 years ago, but um, was there a thought for, because uh, it looked like there were some little fragments on uh, CT or one of the x-rays that maybe he had have also injured his deltoid ligament. Yeah, you know, it's, 14 years ago now, so hard to hard to remember exactly. Um, yeah. I, I don't fix very many deltoids, uh, you know, and maybe I'm behind the times on this, but I, I don't. So um, it'd be interesting to get people's thoughts on that, not to slow the, slow the discussion down too much, but uh, um, I don't fix a lot of deltoids. Uh, I think the, the fibula is the key to the stability of the mortise, um, but, uh, your 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 uh, your experience has been different, Rafi. Yeah, I just um, I find that in well, not this young kid, but in osteoporotic patients, anyone where I'm trying to f protect my construct as much as possible, I don't like the surprise of of uh, of seeing a little bit of a widening of the mortise on their initial post-op X-rays or you know. Rafi, uh, how are you fixing those? Well, it depends on if it comes off the medial malleolus or off the talus, but they get an anchor and uh, direct repair. So side to side repair kind of thing? Mm, uh, uh, yeah, well, just bas they're usually an avulsion off one side or the other, so I just plug it back in. Okay. Ben Lamer talked about this with me 20 years ago. I remember him talking about this and I thought he was like crazy, but it makes sense now when you see some of the repairs. I've seen my partners doing that too, although I agree with Tim. I, I tend to rely more on my fixation and I, I'm, I'm, as you know, I believe the gastric is probably the big problem in a lot of these. So that, that the tension of the gastric is what usually causes the failure. Mm -hmm. Rafi, well, why don't um, you go ahead and uh, yeah. proceed with your case? So um, this is a patient that came to me. Uh, she's 65 years old and relatively healthy. She just has uh, a high BMI, no di diabetes or anything. And she has this uh, just basically ankle pain and deformity uh, from a low energy twist the previous year. So this has been, you know, eight or 10 months or something since her injury. And, um, and this was the, uh, the set of x-rays. Again, this is a little bit older case. So I don't, I don't do things the same way now as far as my workup, but um, it's pretty clear uh, the deformity here on the, on the coronal plane. Um, but I want to sort of um, show you that there's also a, a sagittal plane deformity so um, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just open up to the panel. Is there anything that concerns you about, um, about this uh, low uh, sort of insufficiency fracture? Probably started as a, as a fibular fracture that just became unstable and, and then with her, her crushing weight uh, became a deformity. Would anybody work her up for osteoporosis or anything like that? Uh, maybe, or even neuropathy. I think I've seen this in subtle neuropathy with obesity. Mm -hmm. um, I, you, you think about, you know, insidious failure of the fibula, but it's right. like you say, your, your body mass isn't helping with the deformity. Yeah. So, um, yeah, ideally we'd like long leg film so we really understand our mechanical axis. You could make an argument that my vertical line is not perfectly centered. Um, but the real question is, so everybody probably agrees looking at her clinical uh, image is there where she had uh, quite a lot of valgus uh, and, um, and then these x-rays that she needs to have something in order to relieve her, her pain. Um, so we've talked about this ad nauseum over this 10 week course about how to correct deformities. It's just really the question is, what do you do? Like you, you have so many options. And as, as Mike Sirkin said in the beginning, there's just no wrong answer as far as what you do, you just have to have reasonable um, reasons for what you do. So um, 
so when I, when I approached this case, I, I had to ask myself some essential questions. And maybe I'll ask the panel, what, what, what are the essential questions that you ask yourselves when, um, just when you have a deformity like this, very distal, what are, your, what are the things that you need to answer for yourself to decide which of those types of corrections you're gonna do? Can we just chime in? Yeah, yeah go for it. please. I think, I think the biggest issue for me is uh, it, whatever I'm gonna do, can I one, execute it and maintain it? In other words, can I correct the problem but not insert another problem? And so I always have trepidation on doing, for example, opening wedge medial osteotomies because of the soft tissue envelope. And in this case, this would illustrate for me that I'd far, be far more confident in getting uh, wound closure and stability with a lateral opening wedge than I would with a medial closing wedge or a combination because I would essentially create tension on the lateral side and at the core of the at the medial side of the tibia correct the deformity and and be able to maintain it because of fixed angle implants we now have yeah well that that you, you pretty much combine most of my essential questions in one uh, in one one answer and that number one is can you actually do the correction that you want from the direction that you want is that side available biologically is it sound and that's what you mean i think uh steve by right um the soft tissues and it's very distal but because we have fixed angle implants now that make it a little bit more um stable and then yeah the soft tissues are really the, the main thing is how much of a opening so you kind of have to plan that as part of your you're planning how far and that you know that goes to the the uh, hexapod planning where you know the, the, the structure at risk may not actually be the bone it could be the skin correct so so that's where i was going with this but i still felt with the lateral side um uh i think you have a little more of uh soft tissue available over there than that as the medial side is so um uncovered so there's what her, what's her, that's her clinical picture. And what I decided to do was an opening wedge laterally. Um, but, <clears throat> but I wanted to make sure that I was, the, and, and you, it, you said it exactly, Steve, um, the Cora is very medial. So um, I wanted to make sure that the, but the opening wedge goes lateral so that it keeps going lateral through the fibula. You know, the, the opening wedge would have to go through both. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna you can't just osteotomize the fibula and let it fly. I think I think you have to open it, absolutely, and, uh, yeah. keep it open. So, and then the other part of this is that it's a it's not really a it is a single plane deformity, but but when you're making a wedge, it's a little bit harder to to create a two you know a, a two three sided triangle if you will because you got to open laterally and posteriorly. So that just took a little bit of carpentry to to work on it to get it to be wider on the lateral and posterior sides and narrower on the anterior and medial sides. Um, Rafi, you did, it looks like you used Cancellus graft or did you use a tricortical? I used a tricortical uh, graft and then I, I supplemented it, but, um, but it was primarily tricortical. Um, I used an anterolateral approach and a, a, a lateral fibular approach, although the fibula plate looks kind of anterior, but um, I used two separate approaches for this. Um, uh, Rafi, would it be acceptable to do a biplanar cut, meaning uh, trying to cut the posterior three quarters of the bone and leave the anterior cortex intact in order to correct the posterior, uh, the sagittal plane, um, and also to correct the coronal plane in the way you've done it? Would you? It is such a that's such a wonderful question because um, um, I have to say that uh, before this course. Uh, I never, I have never actually done the bi biplanar osteotomy, and um, I learned that thinking that this is a great thing for the fibula or for the femur, distal femur, um, or proximal tibia, uh, because of the bone surfaces. I just wasn't thinking about that. Uh, it's just sort of very um, tunnel vision, I guess, is trying to get the cor uh, deformity corrected. But that would definitely have given us more surface area, less risk of this not healing, and stability. I think the one thing that you can really see that I, I learned from Ted is that uh, it, not only do you want to correct the uh, frontal plane correction that you've done, but on the sagittal reconstruction, the roof of the tibia, it, you try to make it as, as forward tilted as you can. In other words, 
there are these extended plafonds which are very pathologic to begin with and if you don't correct that it will essentially lead to subsequent subluxation and you've corrected that frontal plane and that's probably the advantage of also having that anterolateral frontal plane implant to correct or help maintain that from failing because that's that would basically negate all the efforts you made laterally. Rafi, yeah, that you was have to do any uh, soft tissue procedure like uh, lengthen the perineals or transfer the perineals or anything like that? That's one of the questions from the participants. Yeah, that's uh, that is one of the essential questions at the beginning, right? Is can the soft tissues handle it? And um, uh, I did not have to. Um, I did not have to. It took a while for um, for her to get. Uh, her strength and, and motion back, but but she actually did fairly well. Um, I'll just click through a couple of the. Now I don't have all of her uh, her whole chronicity uh, documented here. Uh, this is some early when she began weight bearing is when I started to see uh, callus forming. Uh, early range of motion. This is still only at like the eight or ten week point where I where I, I had my camera with me and and took the, the photos. But she she progressed to unaided walking and and you know and then eventually was discharged happy. So uh, I did not do um, any tendon lengthenings. But that is a great question because, you know, depending on the chronicity of this, and maybe uh, somebody in, on the panel will be able to, to talk more about this, but I, I just, I guess I would determine whether or not the, the perineal tendons were staying in their home. If they're sub wanting to subluxate for, uh, after lengthening the fibula, then you're going to have to do something. Uh, but I think I would evaluate that, uh, and I did evaluate it intraoperatively, and if the perineals were still staying in where they needed to be, and I wasn't having a eversion of the foot in a, in a, just a, a resting state, indicating that I had over, you know, that it, they were too tight, then I, then I leave them. I think that uh, I've seen that when you have really laterally translated hind foot, and you're correcting it, and to correct that plane, then almost always the perineals are an inhibitor. Actually, the biggest worry there is like we talked about with opening wedges is whether you can close the lateral skin. Now I'm dealing with that in the patient right now. Um, I had a case 20 years ago or more, 25 years ago that we did an opening wedge medial osteotomy. And when I finished the correction of the tibia, his foot was incredibly deformed and I would have had to cut everything medially. And I, I didn't know really what to do. So I closed the wound and I asked Ted what to do. And he just looked at me and smiled and said, don't worry, he'll stretch it out. And sure enough, he did over the ensuing three months on the medial side. Tim uh, Weber, would you do anything, uh, would you have done something different with the fibula or in this case, because it's closer to the ankle? Because uh, in your talk, uh, I think you had a different opinion about what to do with the fibula. Well, I think you have to, I mean, obviously you have to osteotomize it here. And because you went to the lateral side and opened, I think that uh, uh, what he did is, is uh, pretty much all you could do. Um, if you were doing a closing wedge on the opposite side, uh, I probably would still uh, cut the fibula and allow it to seek its position. Um, the problem is, is that it's such a huge correction. Uh, if you were correcting this from the medial side, I would think that uh, there would be a fair amount of offset there. Um, mm -hmm. It would be really tough to, to correct for the medial side. But like Steve pointed out, to me, you know, it, it makes you think uh, uh, like it's uh, uh, neuropathy. There's a subtle neuropathy there. And, and you know, getting that to heal with a or an opening wedge uh, op osteotomy is, is a uh, gutsy move. I guess. Um, so kudos to you for making it, making it work. I'd be curious as to, you know, was your cut then sort of front to back? Because when you're, when you're cutting on the lateral side, I always think it's a little harder to protect all the soft tissues, both in front and behind the, the tibia. So I just, if you, 10 seconds to tell us how you did that. Yeah, the cut was from front to back. Um, and through that anterolateral approach, I basically uh, put a couple of wires. I wish I had saved my floral views, but uh, put a couple of wires. Um, I started with the saw, but I completed it actually with an osteotome so that when I went to the back, I wasn't chopping anything up like the FHL or anything back there. So um, yeah, it was, and, the, and you can kind of see even on this, it just the osteotomy is not as clean back here. 
Um, but yeah, that's, I just used, I started with a saw and ended with a, with an osteotome, uh, sharp osteotome. And you can do that in the metaphyseal bone much easier than you can mm. up in the shaft. Yeah, for sure. And Iliac yeah. crest graft for that exact reason, because I was concerned that, um, that there would be healing problems in a middle-aged uh, uh, person. Rafi, can you comment on, in a very distal uh, deformity like this and with osteoporosis, I mean, these are large corrections. How did you actually execute the correction intraoperatively before you put in the bone graft? So you, if you look right here, you can see that my opening wedge actually goes, doesn't ex, it's not supposed to exit. You know, Mauricio made a lot of uh, points about this during the knee section about how to protect the medial hinge. And um, I, I intentionally made my, uh, my convergence on the medial side, medial to the malleolus, knowing that it hopefully will just sort of deform. Uh, and then um, when I have osteoporotic bone, um, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll start by stacking osteotomes. I'll take a couple of straight osteotomes and then a curved osteotome in between them. Um, and that way, when you're pushing, you're pushing on broad surfaces, even broader than with a, a lamina spreader. So um, that's, how I, that's how I deal with, with it. And then the other thing is that, you know, you are, in, in a way, you're compacting that bone on the distal segment a little bit as you as you distract it. But, but I, I just use osteotomes rather than just trying to, to pull with, you can't use distractors really in osteoporotic bone as well, uh, but you can certainly, and I, I think I, I don't know if I added, I don't think I added a distractor on this case. I think it was all within the osteotomy that I distracted. And just, it took my time and did it slowly. And I did still break the hinge as you can see, uh, but because I had the, this implant in this position, it, it, it was able to control it. Ralph, how'd you deal with the syndesmosis? Um, well, because the fracture goes right above it, um, I just, um, I just cut right through th this. There is still some a uh, AITFL and PITFL, uh, ligaments attached between the fibula and the tibia. So I didn't really specifically deal with the joint itself. I didn't go into debride it or anything, um, or try to try to match. I did. I just, uh, I just fixed I just distracted the fibula and let it sort of come, go where it would want it to go. So it is, there is callus in there already. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a deformity you start with. So uh, I, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to make that better. Yeah. So in other words, the, you're just above uh, the, the distal part has all the syndesmosis on it and, and you distracted kind of at the proximal edge of it. That's right. So yeah. no ligaments were uh, detached. It, Rafi, no. did, you, did you stack your osteotomes? Yep. I, I, you know, uh, Mike, I have an example of that on that really osteopenic lady. But the one thing that I've learned is that um, when I see the relationship that the distal tibia and fibula are okay, I want to never have that change. So I put essentially a number of wires between the fibula and the tibia, and I can pivot on that surface with the same understanding that you're pivoting with the, laminar, the uh, osteotomes you can open it up and not engender a secondary deformity at the ankle relationships if they're intact like this is. <clears throat> if it's thin stoats, it doesn't matter. Yep. But uh, if it's not, you, you don't realize how much force you're putting as you distract. And I've sometimes had the laminar spreader, distractor, and then uh, the osteotomes, and then put a uh, device between the osteotomes, either a laminar spreader or a third osteotome to generally correct the deformity. Yeah. I want to say I pinned the fibula to the talus or, or, you know, or to the distal tibia, I mean, and, uh, but I can't, I just honestly can't remember what I did in this case. I think that's probably what I would do now. Okay. I think that's a great case. Um, I'm going to abort your control and I'm going to give, uh, Keith some control. Okay. Keith, uh, I believe this is your case. This is me. Steve. This oh, is me. I'm sorry, Steve. Actually, I made a mistake. Hold on. Let me just let me. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Okay, Steve, you should be able to get control now. Okay. Uh, this is a 68 year old lady who came actually because she was walking on uh, the medial side of her foot, but her primary actually complaint was. She presented with knee pain. I think I actually even had 
Keith look at, or she got sent to Keith for what to do with the knee. Her ankle, she'd had an injury at 12. She'd had two operations. You can see the remnant of a K-wire there and these old, I think, Woodruff screws that were put in when she was 12. And uh, now she was complaining of really significant knee pain and uh, her ankle or foot essentially was deformed by virtue of her malalignment. You can see how flat her foot is as a result of the uh, malalignment of her ankle. And uh, when I looked at it, I, I realized that her major deformity, even though the fibula may be a little bit short, um, she had some sort of uh, injury probably to a growth plate when she was young. And the major deformity correction could be done above. And you can see she's had a long standing synostosis of the tip fib joint. So um, I told her that probably the best thing would be to correct her uh, deformity with a closing wedge osteotomy. In the next uh, picture, you can see her, her standing uh, malalignment. Uh, you can see that the valgus of her foot and her ankle, what happened? Uh, also um, creates even more angular malalignment at her knee. And she was, was complaining of lateral knee pain. It's, it's moderately arthritic, but her valgus of her ankle really generates a huge lateral load beyond the uh, actually outside her knee joint. So um, before you even think about correcting the knee, I think it's, it was important to correct her foot position. So uh, this is a case where uh, I was always tre trepidation about doing opening wedge medial osteotomies, but I think closing wedge medial osteotomies are a bit safer, although that's where your implant goes. <coughs> so I um, planned where I was gonna have the exit point lottery, and you can see there will probably be a little bit of translation. This kind of illustrates that if I tried to have this exit uh, right next to the lateral edge of the fibula. And by taking the wedge out, you can see on the image on the right, um, it's all done through a straight medial incision. And when you take out the wedge, um, you can see that all the way over to the fibula from the medial side. Uh, and I, I'm afraid of the uh, FHL. And so I just retracted it with some brain retractors to keep it protected and then basically shifting in one plane uh, to a closing wedge. This just shows now, initially I anchored the fibula just to keep it from translating with this screw. And then when I generated the uh, compression, which you can see with the ATD on the top and the picture on the right, as you compress, it's kind of like what you do with an offset at the proximal femur. By um, compressing the osteotomy as we did here uh, and the screw that's just above the osteotomy. When you generate that translation, you have to take that screw out of the fibula. And when we uh, compressed it and brought the um, tibia back under the plate to create correct to the, the uh, malalignment, you can see that the fibula kind of opened up a little bit. Uh, and that then we subsequently replaced that screw uh, from the lateral side. You can see the, uh, the compression. And when you, when you see her lateral view, uh, it corrects her, her alignment, and as we talked earlier, it helps the sagittal plane um, orientation of her ankle. But the, uh, when you look at the uh, lateral view, her biggest challenge now is her knee pain is no longer an issue. She doesn't complain about her knee at all. Her biggest complaint, as you can really see on this x-ray, is her foot has been pronated for so many years that now my whole focus is how to get her to activate her long perineal to bring her medial column down because her first ray is up in the air because it's been pressing, being pressed upon for so many years. So we're getting her just to learn how to activate a muscle that she really hasn't utilized and to get her foot plantar grade in the, in the sagittal plane. I think that's the only, that's the last. Uh, so this ends up not being a wound healing problem in terms of this, the incision. The skin can tolerate that. Uh, the opening wedges obviously are more complicated. Does anyone have any uh, questions for Steve? Yeah, I got a couple quick questions. I'm curious. So um, usually when I have a deformity higher up but together with an ankle and a foot that's sort of chronic, I, I usually, in my mind, I usually um, start from the one that's most proximal and work my way down. 
um, so that I, it's just easier for me because it's too complicated to try to do it all in one shot. Um, when, you, when you do do the ankle first without correcting the upper tibia deformity, are you aiming to get the joint angle normal to the tibial shaft or are you looking at the mechanical axis? What are you aiming for when you're uh, doing just the ankle correction without looking at the upper tibia or the length? Well, in this case, I think, in a lot of cases, I think Keith and I talk about this all the time when we have deformities on both ends of the tibia. The, the big issue is uh, creating a plantar grade foot if that's the expense of the subtalar joint versus the tibial tailor joint. In her case, uh, her ankle, although it was markedly deformed, her, her complaint really was walking on the medial border of her foot. Her ankle didn't really hurt that much. It was over the last year, her knee started hurting her more and more. And that's what she came to uh, initially to, to be evaluated for. And her ankle, she realized was starting to bother her more. But her major reason for coming to the doctor was her knee pain. And when we looked at the way her foot deformity was progressing, it it's obviously was insidiously generating forces on the lateral compartment. And, you know, at 68, uh, if you could give her an ankle that's plantar grade, I don't think she needs a total ankle or any kind of uh, ankle procedure, but she could get a knee replacement. But like a lot of these I've seen, I learned this really from, from listening to a, a number of people, Jeff included, and um, they, they, a lot of the knee or other joint symptoms go away or become much less of a problem when their malalignment is corrected. Yeah, I, I saw her... Steve and I shared this case. I saw her first, and I wouldn't have known what to do with it. I mean, her the proximal two thirds of her tibia were normal. True, she had some mild valgus associated with lateral compartment cartilage loss, but I would not have known how to correct that with the coexisting ankle deformity. So the goal was to get her as anatomic as possible distally and see what happened with the knee. I have a question. In this particular case, Steve, thanks for sharing the case. This patient already had a leg shortening. You can see there is a pelvic obliquity in the alignment study. Uh, and if you go back, yeah, there. There is a, sh a shortening of this leg, valgus deformity at the level of the ankle, at the level of the knee as well. And you did a closing wedge medium. What are your considerations uh, in terms of including leg length discrepancy in your planning? Well, you know, I, I actually, I should really get her, get standing films on her now with her correction because there's so much valgus of her foot and there's so much leg length difference just related to her flat foot that I, I don't think I could compute how much uh, shortening she really has on that side. And I will make sure because she's now walking independently, I will get standing films now because a lot of times they're so used to the position of their leg, that's the way they sit, but her pelvic obliquity may not be nearly as significant. Um, and in this case, obviously at her age, I don't think I would have wanted to, for example, do a lateral opening wedge of, the, um, of, the, of this limb for a number of reasons because her foot deformity was substantially uh, chronic, long-standing. That I think it would have been, I, I would have been more afraid of uh, what would I have done on the lateral side, trying to lengthen through this deformity. But I, I know what you're talking about, and you know, obviously now everybody wants to be the normal length, never wear a lift. And if you talk to a lot of these people, uh, they just want to have their joint not hurt, and they're willing to deal with a little bit of a lift in their shoe or a modification on the bottom of their shoe because they just want to be able to walk. Steve, there are a couple of uh, participant questions um, that uh, haven't really gotten addressed yet. So one was, did you uh, feel like you really needed to fix the fibula in this case? And then the other is when using the articulated tensioning device, how do you uh, avoid opening the opposite cortex? So that, that was, I think that uh, we heard about that just related to uh, the Raphael's case where you're trying not to uh, have this uh, shift and initially when I cut it I didn't exit laterally but you can see what happens just with the tensioning device compressing the um, osteotomy you need to shift the tibia back underneath the plafond and 
that required me to remove the wire that I used. And like uh, Raphael's case, I would many times to avoid the, this from uh, generating a failure, I would put a wire right next to the area to try to act as a, a dynamic so-called hinge so that in theory you could fatigue it without it actually failing. But then you see in this case, it actually failed and see this little cortical fragment that, get, that got broken off that I did not create with our, um, with our saw. Uh, during the possibility of process, process of the osteotomy. Um, uh, you probably didn't need to fix the fibula. And in fact, uh, because the synostosis was solid, probably I could have left it alone. I just did everything. Uh, I had this, I didn't actually open the fibula at all. I just had made, put this retrograde wire initially up a screw and then converted it back to a screw at the end. Probably didn't doesn't that kind of function like protecting your hinge, having the fibula fixed when you're compressing? Oh yeah, totally. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I yeah, I totally. Yeah, if you look at where the forces of compression are, if you can see um, Rafi's case where he went anterolateral, I've done closing wedge osteotomies and corrected the uh, frontal plane as well with a single um, lateral incision where I put an anterolateral plate uh, laterally, you know, anter through the anterolateral side of the tibia, it's much more difficult because you have to lift the anterior compartment up, but you can actually can do both fixation points in one. Uh, Ted taught me that long ago, and the most important thing in those situations was to tension the fibula, but then I also compressed the tibia. You can, he thought you couldn't correct the sagittal plane, but I've done that, uh, recognizing that I perhaps didn't want to make two incisions like Rafi did for the tibia. Uh, it depends on really the sagittal correction that you're trying to get, whether you can accomplish that totally through a lateral uh, approach. Okay. Steve, how long do you give them to, uh, to compensate for the corrections that you've made in someone who's got a chronic deformity like this? What do you tell them? How do you advise them with regard to how long it'll take and what particular exercise program would you give, them, give her uh, uh, or emphasize to, to lengthen her perineals? Or, or, or posterior or was the, on the, for her, In her case, her biggest problem was uh, when she was plantigrade, her, her foot was so flat, but she had never really activated her long perineal. So her foot is essentially now supinated compared to what it originally was flat. And it's just because she hasn't used her motors to correct her foot deformity. Uh, I worry um, much more with varus deformities because the structures that you are trying to address many times will be a tether that you either have to directly do something about at the time of your correction. Uh, we had a case just the other day where essentially we thought, okay, if we correct this subtater deformity, the, the posterior tip is gonna be the offending problem. And when we went to look at this posterior tip, it wasn't functioning at all. You couldn't lengthen it, it didn't move. So you really need to remove that. And uh, with this lady, it was just primarily learning her to, how to activate her long perineal to get her foot plantigrade. Her ankle didn't hurt anymore, and her knee doesn't hurt. It's just getting her foot position proper, and we give them a, uh, a medial column um, recession under her first ray to get her first ray down. And that, that really is uh, helpful. In, in cavus feet, it's always harder. And it's interesting, in our clinic, most of the problems are related to cavus feet and getting their medial column to be functioning properly because they always end to be slightly supinated. Their subtalar joint is essentially cocked and they can't really activate their subtalar joint to go into any kind of valgus or, or pronation. They just, it doesn't go. And that's a long-standing problem that they've had their whole life. And so it's very hard to correct that or make that uh, uh, work. But a good therapist, we, we're using taping a lot now to tape the lateral side uh, in cavus feet uh, and then flat feet to take the medial side. And that actually, it's, it's very helpful because surgically we can't necessarily correct those problems. So that kind of brings up a question one of the participants had. Should, should they have a, a TMT for, or first TMT fusion for the forefoot supination? And then is, another question was, was there any medial ankle instability afterwards? No, not in this, but you know, that's, I, I hate to, I, we don't have to talk about uh, medial column stabilization. TMT fusions are, you should really recognize our medial, you should think about it as a medial column. Ted taught me that long ago. The TMT joint is important, but a lot of these people have not only TMT instability, they have intercuneiform instability. So if you do 
a first ray stabilization, that will not correct their deformity. And in fact, you make it worse because their, their medial column becomes longer, but they're unstable at the inner cuneiform joint and their first ray never is down plantigrade and they still remain actually even more because they have a longer bone now because you haven't really corrected their, their sagittal axis. Okay, that was very good. Thank you, Steve. Um, now this is uh, Keith's case and we'll uh, give him control. Okay, so, uh, seven months out from a motor vehicle crash, um, you can see the, the next one. Okay. I don't have any. Okay. There we go. So there's the initial post-operative with my two least favorite findings on any kind of post-operative foot and ankle film. <laughs> number one, staples. And number two, uh, large fragment screws. Um, so, and I'm gonna, I don't think we need to stay with this one. We'll go to the next, the healed view. So this is where we finally see here at seven months. And we have an intra-articular component, but um, I'm, I'd be interested in, in everybody else's interpretation of um, what they think the predominant problems are here. So the, the, the joint, Deformity. Fortunately, this was a a would have been a gift pilon for anybody that had basically had two very large fragments. Um, sort of Don't say that. <laughs> hmm? Not a gift. Go well, on. I mean, and on a relative on a relative scale. Okay. So maybe I can go back. So that's where we were before. There. And then just a few cuts from the axials. I don't have any other imaging, but I think we have a pretty good idea of. So, well, well how, well, what should we do as far as prioritizing the deformity? So the interarticular component is um, relatively straightforward. What about the rest of it? Steve? I think the most important thing is, uh, uh, and not to harp on it, but it's beautifully illustrated here in the sagittal plane. The articular surface of the tibia is literally like a ski jump, and it's the a lot the ability for the talus to be captured under the tibia is uh, devoid of support. And so, if you look where the lateral bus is, the talus is, and draw up a, a line up from that, that should normally go through the middle of the plafond. And obviously, you see now it's markedly forward, so that correcting the deformity, the, the, the forces are huge on the front of the tibia now. And it, this is not gonna end well unless you are able to bring the foot back under the tibia, which means that things are quite short. Because if you look where the foot fragment is on the AP, you have to sort of bring everything down and around, which means she's really gonna be tight more severely. Uh, that's really your goal is to get coverage of the ankle in the front and the tail is back under the tibia. Okay, Mike, Brett, anybody else want to comment on other deformities? This is sort of, guess what I'm thinking. Okay, we'll go ahead. So Keith, she had medial incision and lateral incision, no anterior yeah. incision, correct? Yeah, and she, she had been, um, she had been, she had about a 10 year pack. She started smoking when she was 12 and quit at the time of this accident. And um, her incisions are well healed. There's no evidence of secondary infection as far as we can tell. Um, and the skin is okay, it's not great. Okay, I mean, it's-, it's her, her, This is Rafi. Her fibula her. looks really long uh, and her syndesmosis looks obviously very wide. So I think that's gonna have to be Address it's and and I have to say I have to echo what Steve said Bernerska said that the B type pilon is not to be messed with <laughs> and uh, and not to be underestimated. It, I don't I don't consider these a gift at all. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I think that 
the gift is the you have two large articular segments. That's the right. only gift. That doesn't mean that that makes it easy. Yeah, and you, you know, Rafi, I don't think the pivot is so long as much as the talus has found a new home in the within yeah. the plafond because the the if you look at the fibular tater joint, you can see what'll happen is if the if the talus is brought down distally. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Well, I want to I want to belabor this because me. Uh, the intraarticular components are all individualized, and, and Sean showed a case last time. And um, I thought this was going to be more straightforward um, than it was, um, but I missed—I didn't really miss the extraarticular components um, because I had planned initially on a staged reconstruction because I didn't think her soft tissues could sustain the metaphyseal component, but. This was an extended carpentry exercise. I, you know, at seven months, there are no fracture planes. So it's an example of essentially in the hip or acetabulum, it's surgical secondary congruence, which is what it is here. And I only made a small anterolateral arthrotomy. I didn't think that my intraarticular visualization, even with the distractor, would help me that much. Maybe that's an incorrect assumption. And then a sort of an iliac crest bone graft, and then a buttress. And then there's a question of what to do with the fibula. And um, we'll see what that was a, um, a valid point when we get to the final films. So initially, we left the fibula intact. So my, my impression was that there was fairly significant valgus. And that was related to the fact that this extended Volkmans fragment was attached to the fibula. The fibula was plated probably slightly malrotated and in valgus. And so there was a malunion between the distal tibial diaphysis and the postural lateral fragment. Um, and I thought that I would just um, accept that and get a joint that was congruent um, and then if I needed to, I would come back and do the supramalleolar osteotomy uh, at a secondary stage. I was concerned about the soft tissues. Um, uh, that's a retrograde excuse for leaving what we ended up with. So there we are intraoperatively. This is one of probably 15 intraoperative floral views with various states of um, uh, remodeling the, that large uh, anteromedial fragment. And then this is uh, the final reconstruction. Um, and this is a much older case. I ultimately had to go, had to address the fibula. And, our, and the fibular anatomy is improved, but obviously the relationship between that postural lateral fragment and the intact tibia didn't change. So it was an exercise in futility. And so these are her final films at a little over three years out. Um, she's, I don't have a good idea of how much initial wear there was because we did, I did not have a good intraarticular view. Um, but the joint is congruent. This is the point where I tried to get her to go see Steve because I thought she needed um, a frontal plane or coronal plane co correction, because she's in, I thought, significant still valgus, and, um, and probably an anterior uh, ankle decompression. Um, that's her motion, charitably, is, um, barely to neutral, and only about 10 degrees of plantar flexion. So, so had it to do over again. I have a question for you, Keith. Uh, in this case, it looks like uh, your main goal was to restore the continuity or the containment of the joint, because apparently the talus was having a, an interior subluxation, and by restoring the anterior aspect of the pilon, you were able to contain the joint. Do you believe this is a kind of very fair statement that may apply to every joint once you restore containment? Uh, you may improve very much the survivorship of the joint and get a better function to the to the joints. Yeah, I think that's absolutely the case. I think the problem is it's a more 
underlying uh, cartilage wear, the farther uh, deterioration of joint, the more critical it is that all the associated periarticular deformities are addressed as well. So a, a normal ankle might have tolerated this residual deformity, I think, relatively well, but not in this case. So um, I don't think she ever saw Steve. Um, at this point, she had no insurance and uh, was functioning okay, at least that, that was per her perception. So if you look, um, this is, uh, Mauricio, if you look at, uh, you know, there's, it, there is an articular malalignment in the back, but the most important take home from this is how f the frontal plane of the tibia was corrected sufficiently to help the tailor position. That classic um, osteophyte you see on the neck of the talus as it goes into the joint, uh, uh, Dick Lang taught me long ago about, you know, managing ankle stiffness. It's a multi-planar problem many times, but you address the dorsal contracture if there is one, and then many times you don't know how much the anterior lesion is the problem, but my goal has always been when I'm finished is that I can see the talus actually come underneath uh, the plafond on the lateral view, on a dorsal flexion lateral, not neutral. Uh, they have to come beyond neutral because what happens in many of these is they stay in this equinus position and even if there is not initially an articular problem their capsule will scar down directly onto the plafond uh, onto the tailor body and when you actually take it apart you realize that the, there's bone that's actually formed onto the front of the talus on the articular surface because it's been sitting in that position for so long so how much of that do you think was, I mean, are you saying that you would have done an anterior um, sort of? I would have done it now. I think you correct your oh. deformity. I think the main thing is, and I, I harp on, that's why I, you know, uh, I learned long ago that a, the C-arm always lies and I need to get a plain radiograph lateral to know that I have the patient plantar grade. And if I don't, what is it going to take to get there? And, and this problem, I'm amazed if you didn't have to release her gastro because she that this must have been quite tight to be able to get her even to neutral at the end of this. Well, there. Yeah, I, don't, I, I don't remember what her intraoperative views are. This is a this is a little over three years. So, so a couple of participants had questions about um, with the final ankle range of motion. You know, would you consider uh, is that much better than doing a fusion? And then the other uh, potential reconstruction thing that was brought up would be how about distraction uh, arthroplasty uh, with uh, this uh, with the correction that you did? So I don't have any experience with distraction arthroplasties in, in the foot and ankle, very little in the upper extremity. So I, I can't comment on that. Maybe Steve Quinn can uh, let us know what he thinks. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think for distraction arthroplasty, one of the keys is you really need to have everything kind of perfectly lined up for it to be optimal. And uh, if you do that, it, it does uh, improve some of the symptoms, but I think that you, you want everything kind of optimal before, uh, before in tandem with doing that. The other question was about whether this is better than an ankle arthrodesis. Well, I, I guess the, my answer to that would be that I would never attempt an arthrodesis in an ankle in that position. I, no, no, I mean, he, I don't think he meant like acutely, but would you uh, now, like where they were at, is it time to consider a fusion, basically? Well, I mean, she didn't think so, and I, I, I don't really know. I can't extrapolate what kind of life this ankle has with an appropriate decompression, and probably, as Steve has all pointed out, a... a How old is this woman now, Keith? What did you say, she's 40? Uh, no, she's, at this point, she's a little over 30. So, you know, ankle replacements, uh, bad. Um, Ted, Ted uh, showed us that. And uh, fusions at 30 means subtalar arthritis at 40. And the, the problem is now with the advent of uh, these dynamic uh, carbon fiber braces, I mean, this woman would be very functional. I think I, I have learned that uh, what's important from the Texas experience is if you can get the patient plantigrade, that's the optimal. The early braces were fixed in Aquinas, which really was not, it obligated a lift. But if you can have the patient plantigrade, and that would in this case would be just a small chylectomy and fitting with a brace, 
this patient could walk relatively normally and you would protect her subtalar joints. And that's clearly the way to manage this. Now, I would never, uh, and I, I always do that first before I just say I'd go to a fusion because many of these people think they need a fusion and they come back and they say they're fine. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, any motion is better than no motion for the other joints for the most part. And then, so Steve, are, are you uh, kind of referring to the PTB AFO brace that you would have them use or? Correct. Yes, it originally was called the Adeo, but now it's, it's much more sophisticated in the sense that the struts are adjustable, foot position is adjustable. You don't have a fixed device, it's very modular. And uh, it's, it's uh, variably, uh, you know, can be positioned with position to the foot. It's actually been ideal. And, you know, you can get show part dislocations, all kinds of various deformities, ambulatory with relatively normal gait with uh, that brace. And it's cheap compared to, you know, a prosthesis, for example. There was one quick question about whether or not additional imaging would make change your plan surgically for me. And I think that Maurizio has already uh, hit the primary point, and that is that if you can restore a congruent joint um, that is close to anatomic, then um, that would be always the uh, preferred initial outcome. And then staging that to whatever is as necessary to salvage would be next. Steve, they, somebody wants to know the name of the brace. Okay, the problem is the, or, the original name, and they can look it up online, was called the IDEO because it was initially uh, popularized because of these kids getting blown up in Afghanistan in the early 2000s. But the current version of the brace doesn't have a sexy name. It's just called the a Dynamic Carbon Fiber AFO. Um, Dave Hughes is the one that actually has, has championed it because he's trying to convince prosthetists around the country how to make it. And unfortunately, he's like a lot of these courses, he's actually tried to go out to various locations and teach prosthetists how to make this. And he's come back kind of like we come back from a course thinking, have we really been able to get our point across? And now he's realizing that they really have to come to his office for about three days or four days and see 15 of these made to understand the nuances of it. But it's clearly uh, in my estimation, the biggest advance we can do for people with severe hind foot trauma because it allows them to be amazingly functional and it fits in many different devices, ski boots, snowboard boots, hiking boots. And uh, it really, it, it protects, as Brett says, the uh, uh, other essential joints from degradation. Yeah, I would just echo that if I can. Uh, you know, uh, one more thing that Steve's taught us, but... Uh, uh, we've been using them as well, and uh, they really are a game changer, especially in this uh, age group, you know, where um, there aren't a lot of good options. So uh, the brace has been, been super helpful to us. And in morbid obesity, it's amazing. Uh, you know, I had a 75-year-old guy who came with bad ankle arthritis, 268 pounds, 270 pounds, and, uh, you know, he wouldn't be a good candidate for a fusion. I am for a replacement, a fusion would be quite difficult because you've got some neuropathy. And I always start off with this first and insurances will pay for it. And then uh, they then decide after that, okay, do you want to go further or are they happy with what they have? You can totally modify how much pressure the foot sees. Uh, so it's pretty, it is pretty helpful for sure. Mike, I think you're muted, Mike. Um, uh, Mike, do you want to go back a bit? Yeah. Yeah, this Sorry, one's Mike. I apologize, everyone. We have about 10 minutes, Raul, to go through your case, okay? Why don't I just go through it quick? Good. Okay. So this is a case that uh, was presented to me by one of my joint surgeons, 63-year-old female with deformity, limp, and pain, and was looking for a knee replacement. It has a remote history of a fracture treated like this, eventually healed. And this was one of the cases I gave you to measure at the beginning. And I'd like to share my screen. Can I do that, Mike? Go. 
Okay, share screen. So uh, you guys actually measured all of these, this case, and what we found was uh, that there is some variability in your measurements. But if you look over here, this is about what everyone measured, about 20, 20 degrees of varus, total varus on the left side, four degrees of varus in the femur, about 16 degrees of varus in the tibia. The joint was parallel. And then I'm gonna show you something else which I didn't include on the first measurement is the, is the sagittal plane. And when you look at the sagittal plane, I'm just gonna blow this up a little bit more and how to measure the sagittal deformity. Uh, when we look at that, you can see, this is from George Paley's book where he, where he takes the four-fifths of the proximal tibia and it's four-fifth, one-fifth, and the proximal angle is about 80 degrees. And I actually, so I measured it on my bone setter and found it's about a 26 degree procurvatum deformity. Uh, there's also a slight, it's about a 27 degree uh, external rotation deformity. And I thought this case was a good case for uh, multiple options, including your mathematical def mathematical osteotomy. And so uh, I'll just show you what how I planned it and what I did and you can and we'll leave it up there and you guys can practice later uh, as this is the case. And so the options I tried was because we knew there was a leg length discrepancy as well of about two centimeters two and a bit and that's what you guys all measured. The, the option was, of course, an opening wedge at the Cora, like I did here. And then Rafi showed me a great way to do a dome uh, where he uses the center of rotation. Uh, that's where the Cora is, and then makes a dome with the hip center and basically cuts that out. And that's what that would look like with a dome. And uh, then if you're on the other side, you can certainly uh, go back and do a closing wedge instead of an opening wedge. And that would look something like this. And that would get you into the line, but that would get you a little shorter. And if you looked at the length, this is the other leg that I brought in here. The dome gets you not quite the right length. The closing wedge really gets you short. The, the opening wedge, let's go back and do the opening wedge again. The opening wedge gets you, let's see, whoops, gets you pretty close to the length. Of the, of the, of the tibia and that, that's what I picked. And in the sagittal plane, you can see what I did here again. I, I did the same thing. Can we go back to the slides? Oh, I have to stop sharing. Of course, that's me, stop share. Now, Mike, can you share again? Yep. And so let's go to the next slide. Whoop. Those are my measurements. Mike, can you go to the next one? I can't seem to figure out how to do that. So that's what I did. There's the, sag there's the sagittal plane as well. Go to the next slide. And that's what it looked like on the sagittal plane. And it was about a 26 degree on the sagittal and it was about, uh, eight, about 16 to 20 degree uh, for the varus. Can you go to the next one? Yeah, I gave you back control. Okay, so this is, this is how I planned to do it. And, and it, I didn't quite do it, do what I wanted. And I wanted to do an opening wedge. So I wanted to collect, correct a little bit of the rotation. I wanted to collect, correct the varus. I wanted to correct the procrevatum and I wanted to correct the length. And when I did the osteotomy, you can see that I, I was drilling across. I, I picked my Cora and then I was drilling across and I broke the back, even though that I wanted to go transverse. I kind of broke this piece after I used the osteotome. I think it helped me a bit, uh, but then uh, we nailed it. And you can see, I think if you saw that, how did we correct it? This is my thumb. And it actually just wanted to go back to where it was probably originally. And you know, I was thinking of, of, of cutting the fibula, as you can see the fibula fracture up here for, that had healed. And it, it actually, we didn't need to do anything. Uh, 
And you know, the varus side, opening the varus side, uh, we didn't lengthen the lateral side that much. And, and I think we got our correction. So can we go to the next one, Mike? Or I can do it, yeah, there you go. That's what it looked like. And uh, let's go to the next one. And that's at about a year. Uh, I didn't measure it at the end because I wanted to leave a couple of things. I know what all the measurements are, but I'm gonna leave this case up for people to do if they wanna do homework later. And you can try, I, th I thought it was a really good one to do the mathematical osteotomy and, uh, and you could practice the dome and uh, also maybe uh, do the osteotomy on the, on the exercise and then measure uh, how you can correct the length. Uh, the rotation, I think we eyeballed, we got pretty close. We did a CT scanogram at the end. And also you, can, you really have to think about the length. Now you can see she's got a little bit of arthritis uh, on the medial side. And I, I think my correction actually wasn't enough. Uh, I think you could have gotten a little bit more because you want to protect the arthritic side. Uh, and, but she's about five years out now and she still hasn't got a total knee yet. And uh, my, uh, my arthroplasty partner who had been sending all this stuff to Bob Taiji, one of my uh, excellent partners, and I learned a lot of stuff from him. Uh, they're starting to send them to me now. Uh, but uh, I don't think I'll get the results he does. He can often get people to not with osteotomies around the knee, which he's a magician at, to, uh, to you know, prolong their uh, getting knee replacement. Uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. I wanted to be fairly quick. Um, hey, Raul, can you uh, tell them what the case title is? It's gonna be Final Case, F-I-N-A-L-C-A-S-E. And I'll put it up as homework. And, uh, and then uh, I'll, this time, I'll, if you put your email address when you sign in, I'll, uh, it depends on how many. We've had about uh, 200, 220 people who've done the first sets of assignments. I haven't checked the ones that you said, like, like you said, the, this week, but uh, most of them are quite I interesting, uh, you know, how, how they do the measurements. We'll go back and, we, and I found like uh, your measurements, one of the things that we talk about all these osteotomies and we say, you know, like what's right, like five degrees off, one and a half centimeters, like what is it right? And yet we still can't, you know, you talk to Mitch and Mitch does such a nice talk about like, well, you got to get the perfect x-ray and, and then, and then we got to measure it right. And then if we can't measure it right, you know, and then we're trying to make it perfect. Like, is this a question for all you guys? Like, what's the end point? Is it perfect? Is it five degrees? Is it 10 degrees? Is it kind of like, you know, and Steve, you're using, Steve Quinn, you're using like lengthening and you have to adjust them at the end. And they, sometimes the right length, exactly the same length is too long. So I just leave that out for you guys. So what's the end point? What is the correction that's good? Is it back to normal? Is it less than a little bit normal? Is it more than a little bit normal? Depending on the thing, I, I ask you guys that myself. So maybe you guys can comment on that. Maurizio, what do you think? I would say in this particular case, uh, it's a great correction. Um, as um, Raul pointed out, um, the patient is still has some various deformity with some medial knee arthritis. How old is this patient? I don't recall, Raul. She's 67 now. Yeah. And is she very active, right? She's, you know, she was active. She, she's a, she walks her dog. So that would be the biggest thing she does. So I don't think she walks more than 20, 25 minutes, but that's, that's enough. I would say most likely what I would consider to do now after you corrected the tibia is to evaluate how the joint orientation angle look like with, with the software. And looks like that in case you're going to do a correction, um, you may have to go double level if you wanna bring this knee to neutral. Uh, because it doesn't look like that the MPTA is very abnormal in this case. It's kind of symmetrical to the other side. She has some kind of baseline bearers that I could see on the other side as well. But if she's wearing out on the medial side and you want to unload the medial side, most likely, uh, based on your calculations, you have to go above and below the joint. But it, we have to see the calculations and the angles. So what are you trying to go for? You're trying yeah. to offload it. So you want to go beyond her other side or beyond normal for her. I would because in this case, she's wearing out on the medial side. 
And if you wanna bring her to neutral or to correct the variance that she has as a baseline, um, most likely if the MPTA is normal, you may have to go above and below the joint so you can keep the joint line horizontal and you can correct the joint line offloading the medial side. If you go just to the tibia in this, in this case, if the MPTA is normal, you're going to end up with an oblique joint line. Right. So Keith and Steve, you, yeah. I would say you have the most experience. So Raul's question is, is how much is enough? Is it, and is, other than it depends on the condition you're trying to treat, what do you shoot for? So first Steve, Benerska, then Keith, well, I, you know, I, I'm not going to say that I'm really the expert. I, I remember my mentors, and, and uh, I think Ray Hardy taught us, and there are beautiful illustrations of his overcorrecting for malalignment and not even doing anything with the arthritic joint by just offloading it would give the patient many uh, decades of better function of their, whether their ankle, their knee, or their hip. And I believe that... Uh, now, you know, everybody wants to be perfect. I, and maybe the Swiss just are, are able to be uh, tolerant of more uh, alignment and they don't want to complain. But uh, the deformities that you see corrected now are almost always over what they uh, are initiating with, to hopefully give them more time. But since knee replacements are becoming progressively better, I still think that's a, a salvage option provided you don't have a significant deformity to correct. We were just seeing the ankle. The big problem is that uh, people are trying to do replacements, for example, in significant deformities, and those are disasters, uh, especially in the younger person. So the, the alignment that you're getting, whether we're talking about the tibia distally or the tibia proximally, is based on what the condition of their joint is. And the patient that I sent to Keith, her knee issues really are she, she probably will never need a knee replacement after given talking to her. The more I talk to her, she's just happy that she, that she can do what she wants to do. She still is actually quite active. And I think now this, this will become a non-issue. I, but I, I have to echo really guys like uh, Renee who really taught us long before we started doing all these fancy um, things that we're doing now that the correction of a deformity was excess, in excess helps your arthritic joint. Keith, final comment? You're on mute. Keith, you're on mute. I would not have attempted to, to over overcorrect her metadiaphyseal malunion uh, to create a new deformity to make up for her medial compartment arthritis. Um, so if necessary, I would have come back at the second stage. And the question of joint line obliquity is always a can of worms because we have to remember that <clears throat> the largest series of tibial osteotomies on record was from Paul McKay. And those were domes and there were many extremely oblique joints that lasted upwards of 20 and sometimes 30 years. Is that ideal? Uh, absolutely not. But as maybe a slight counterpoint to Maurizio, I think I would be willing to, to accept slight joint line obliquity um, in the correction of the proximal tibia to avoid a uh, second distal femoral osteotomy in some cases. May I make a comment? Sure. To your comment, I agree with uh, Keith that sometimes you may accept some degree of joint obliquity. In this case, I would also not go primarily to overcorrect. My point was um, now after you, you've got the tibia in a better alignment, if you wanna run the software again and check for alignment, if she has medial compartment pain and you wanna offload the medial compartment, you should go uh, and do some sort of correction around the knee, but most likely I would probably not go to a single bone in this particular case because you may end up with significant joint obliquity if you wanna do it, if the joint orientation angles are normal. In the tibia, you can accept up to 94 degrees. More than that, you're gonna have increased shearing forces. And the big problem would be later when you need a replacement and you're gonna have a significant problem to convert this osteotomy into a replacement without 
significant effort to balance the joint. This would be my comment. Thanks, Maurizio. So um, the learning objectives, I think, I hope we met these. The, I stated them at the beginning after the course, uh, after last week's uh, session. And I hope that we uh, brought some of those uh, issues back. Here we are again. I do want to show one thing because there was a lot of thought about it. I'm going to stop sharing one computer and just switch to the other one. Um, and this is a patient of Steve's that has an ankle fusion. Um, this is his x-rays. But I, what I wanted to do was show you the ADEO or the uh, carbon fiber AFO. Right, Steve? Right, this is a dynamic carbon fiber AFO. Pretty normal looking gait overall, huh? This is about five years ago. I think, uh, you know, he'll tell you that he can walk without it, obviously, but if he likes to hike, he's a nature photographer, that that allows him to do that. And he's, uh, I haven't seen him, you know, I have to call him to check on him, but he's actually, that fits in a ski boot and he's back to skiing with that device. Okay, so these were the learning objectives. So this was where you went all the time at AONA.org. I want to encourage you to continue looking at AONA.org. We'll continue to have more virtual uh, exercises. As we said in the beginning, um, that, uh, that one of the inspirations for this uh, course was, uh, Steve, uh, was uh, Jeff Mast, who recently passed away. Here was a picture of uh, Jeff doing, just drawing on some napkins. Um, I'm gonna uh, just uh, stop sharing uh, for a second. So, and I'm just gonna raise a glass to, to Jeff. I know he's looking down at this uh, course. Um, I had made the comment when Jeff passed away uh, that you know we all look at each other and see how we help our patients. And we help probably, I don't know, in a long career, maybe 400, 300 patients a year at most and multiply that out of a career, you know, of 30, 20 years. So, you know, maybe 6,000. I look at the number of people that have joined this osteotomy course. If I look in, I, I, I just at this course, not to mention all the other people that Jeff has had an influence on, we're looking at millions and millions of people that Jeff's uh, work has touched their these people's lives throughout the world and are better for it because Jeff uh, really did um, inspire everyone to be as good as they could. So this is to Jeff. I know he's looking down at us. He's sorely missed by many people. And, uh, and thank you, Jeff. I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Um, and then the other person I think, and I'll let, I'll let, uh, I'll let uh, Steve Benersch could say something about uh, Sig Hansen because you heard him mention Sig a couple times in his talks. Yeah, so Ted, this is just a picture. I, um, Ted uh, unfortunately had a stroke a year ago, and uh, you know he's he's still there. He can understand. He unfortunately has an expressive patient, but as many of you know, I mean a lot of us that came to Harvard U came totally because of his inspiration to us to go out and do exactly what Mike's talking about, where we would come and learn what he was trying to tell us that we should be doing and then go out and spread the word. And I think many of us have, have taken that as a life lifelong work. And I believe, frankly, that his, his impetus to tell us to do the right thing, not necessarily how to execute it, but to teach us how to look at things uh, in multiple ways, I think is very much like what Jeff did for preoperative planning. Uh, you know, this I brought him into the hospital because he was, uh, he's really kind of trapped at home and even more so now, but he, I've gotten him in on Zoom um, uh, calls to our, our conferences and hopefully I can get him to potentially be able to chime in on some of these um, courses that you guys are doing because he's, he's still there. Unfortunately, he can't contribute as much as he'd like, but um, he, he definitely has been an inspiration to me and to many of us who've been in Harvey. Thanks, Steve. So uh, I'll just back up. You know, this was our plan 10, uh, 10 weeks ago. Uh, this was our basically our pre-op plan. And I think we've executed at least the first two thirds of it fairly well. Uh, and now we're ready for the in-person event. We're uh, 
We're hoping to have it at the new part of the Equendo Center. They're looking into the logistics in Las Vegas. Um, it will be a, a nice day. Um, we plan on having it uh, a full day of practical exercises, uh, but it'll be a half day Friday, half day Saturday with some event where we can all get together and do the thing that AO is, uh, has been known for for years in addition to quality education, but also hanging out, sharing stories, and, and camaraderie and friendship and mentorship. And so I think that's an important part of this and we hope you all can come. We'll have a question about whether you can. We're keeping our fingers crossed. This is Brett, picture of Brett, it's emoji. I don't know how to make this, but he's keeping his fingers crossed. Keep an eye out for it and we'll, we'll hope we can uh, still be able to do it with, uh, with this COVID pandemic. I wanna thank all these fantastic faculty uh, these are the world's experts, I think, uh, without a doubt, in osteotomy. They gave up a lot of time, um, and uh, I salute them as well. Um, people want to congratulate me and Brett uh, for running a great course, but that, without these people, there's no course. Anybody can do what I do and manage and, and, and get people to come and give their talks and hard work, but these are the people that have the knowledge, the expertise, shared it with us, we're open, we're open to criticism and open to teaching and I thank every one of them. So thank you guys. Um, I do wanna give a shout out for our next uh, uh, course, our next live course uh, that will be uh, virtual. And this is, we're gonna run uh, the pelvic and acetabular uh, course. It's going to be uh, a week, it's gonna be a, a course exactly like this one. There's a whole agenda. It's not just a, it's not just a, webin a webinar that you'll drop in for a week. You will come for a course. It's an eight week long course uh, in a similar format. It's going to be, um, I believe on, on Saturday morning, the same time as this. Um, and again, three of the world experts uh, with uh, on pelvic and acetabular surgery, along with some of the people that are on this uh, faculty as well that will all do a tremendous job uh, of giving you uh, knowledge um, here you see the, uh, it, it laid out week by week. So it's not just one thing that you drop in for a week and you should really try to, 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 to come to the entire course, sign up and, and, and do it, especially if you like that. And we will put those up. I'm going to put a, the zoom recordings. We have zoom recordings that come out after 24 hours and they get sent to you, but also don't forget our YouTube channel. I've shown everyone how to go to that. Remember, it's AO Trauma North America YouTube channel, not the AO North America channel, not AO North America. It's the trauma one. We have the entire osteotomy course up there. We have how to put blade plates in there. There's a lot of good information. We plan on continually updating it. If you're looking for, <clears throat> if you're looking for uh, a surgical approach. Uh, that you haven't done in a while, chances are that's, that's probably in there as well. And we'll continue updating that and updating the content. content. So I want to thank you all once again uh, for attending our course, whether it was just a part of it or hopefully many of you, I think, attended all eight weeks. We do have this is a very important question as to whether you're coming to the live event if you're planning on doing it, we really want to do it. And we're trying to get everyone who can. So we may have to have more than one first ones planned. The other question is for only those people that live in Latin America, uh, part of Latin America, if you'd be interested in it, if we have a live event that's for you in Miami, or maybe it can be down a little further south, but we'd like to run uh, a, a couple of these. So with that, I'm gonna uh, end our end my talking and uh, just if you wouldn't mind doing the remainder of the uh, questions, uh, I think that would be great. <laughs>